Welcome to BioBalance Health Cast, episode number 473. What is the worry about bioidenticals? BioBalance Health features conversations about anti aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moffin, medical director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. Dr. Moffin gets questions all the time from people, patients that come to see her, but also from their physicians because the concept of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy is one that mainstream medicine has resisted and struggled to accept. And not a lot of doctors, not enough doctors yet, know what it is and why it is the method of the future. Dr. Maupin is practicing that kind of medicine now. And so one of the things that happens is that she will episodically get a request from a patient that comes to her office. Can you explain to my doctor why, because I'm not medically qualified. If I went to a different doctor Mm -hmm. and they said, well, what is this that you're doing? I would struggle to come up with an explanation. Well, I I told her just to give them give that doctor my book. And she goes, I did, but I don't think she read it. (laughs) And that's also probably true. So the doctor wanted a metabolized explanation of why I use bioidentical hormones. Just just cut to the chase. Right. Bottom line. Yeah. She just, she didn't want to do the work. She wanted me to do the work. So that was fine. (laughs) Okay. So, so in the process of thinking about that, because it's not the only time that happens. Mm -hmm. No. You, you have discussed this with me on a number of occasions Mm -hmm. And being non-medical, I still struggle with some of the terminologies and the concepts. Mm-hmm. You were saying that I, the, there's some confusion around the idea of the phrase bio-identical. What does that exactly mean? Mm-hmm. And you were to explain to me that some drugs are created artificially just from chemicals. Mm-hmm. And some of them have poisons in them. You know, mm-hmm. uh, that, Small amounts of a, a poison that, yes, they Yeah, that, that are used in a good way for good things, but, but they're in there. And that bio-identical hormones... Don't include any of that. Nope. They come from vegetables. Mm-hmm. So they come from a living thing. Mm-hmm. And they have chemical additives that are mixed with the vegetable additives, like they, nitrogen. No, they don't. Bio-chem, bioidentical don't. <clears throat> bioidentical is just from a plant. I, I misunderstood that. So the difference, the difference is bioidentical is... Which is why it, I always get a letter from you when I go to another doctor. <laughs> what, what it means... What it means Strictly definition-wise is that it looks exactly chemically like the hormone that we make in our body. So when you so go to the pharmacy that's the you, definition. and you get a, a prescription, they always give you a fold-out piece mm-hmm. of paper, a little tiny print and, that, that has these chemical chains uh-huh. and, and shows you all the ingredients mm-hmm. that are in it. And but interestingly, if you, if you look at what estrogen looks like for a, an FDA-approved medication – that is only comes in like two strengths, only comes in one way of taking it, but its chemical prop or chemical structure, that little it looks like Tinker Toys, the little chemical structure looks just like the bioidentical picture of estrogen. So it really bioidentical is really more than It's a mirror than, image, it's a reflection. They, they look just like them. Yeah. They're identical. Yeah. But one is made from a bunch of chemicals, one is made from plants. Okay? Okay. So because it's made from plants, it is, it's absorbed better, and most people actually can use it better. They feel better on it. It's, it has less side effects. That's the first thing. But that's a strict definition. But really what we're saying is under an undercurrent. We're saying this is more natural. You can get it made in any dose. You can get it made in any form. You can take it orally. Under the tongue, in a, in a lozenge that you suck on, it goes directly into your bloodstream. Or you can get it in a vaginal tablet for women or a rectal suppository. You can get it in a cream. You can get it in a gel. You can apply it to different parts of your body to absorb into your system so that you can use it. And the delivery system is everything. But when you're looking at something that is FDA approved, it comes in a tiny dose. You'd have to take three times as much 
because they give you the lowest dose possible. So you're spending a ton more money and you're getting too underdosed. little. Underdosed. And, and underdosed means you don't feel better. Right. And it's not really treating you. If they did insulin like that, everyone would die. But because it's women usually and because it's hormones, they just think, oh, well, we're just going to... We're going to torture them a little bit. I mean, honestly, I think that's what they think. We're just not, we don't want any side effects. So we're just going to give them so little they don't even know they have it. That's honestly my view of how the FDA looks at women and hormones. They give us, and every year it's, we need a lower dose of this. Why? The lower dose doesn't give us enough to be like we were when we were 40. So what's, so there's what's a problem. the thinking behind that? Is it to save money? Is it that they think that... <laughs> Women will get the because benefit they're they need from Because they're not women. And they don't think that women should feel the same at 40 or 50 or 60 as they did when they were 30. And we, we people who use the uh, bioidentical hormones, feel like you should have the same blood level of estrogen when you are taking an estrogen as you did at when one point in your one. period, yeah. you know, at one point of your cycle uh -huh. when you were making it. Right. And so that's how we how we look at it, and we don't get the side effects that chemicals do. Maybe they have to go to a lower dose because they have more side effects. I don't know. So the FDA doesn't approve uh, of all of the bioidentical hormones. They're right, and they're in a they're big fight with the compounding pharmacies because they don't like to be out of control. They want to control everything. And they do control Well, they want to ways. standardize everything. And right. that's a different word but, than control. But that's an old theory. One size we fits all. We are looking all. at, we have now become everywhere in JAMA and these other New England Journal right. of Medicine says individualized medicine. Medicine that is made for you. Right. Well, the FDA is still making one size fits all. Right. And that for, for most work. of their years... They based all of their decisions on research that was done on men, not on women. Right. Because so, women weren't in the research population when they were fertile. Statins are so much worse for us than they are for men. But they, they have a lot of side effects for men, too. But mm -hmm. women, in general, have a harder time taking them and just can't take them because of their muscle pain. Uh -huh. so, so it's not the same drug for us as it is for men. Right. At any age. That's just an example. But so the data that supports their decisions is skewed heavily in favor of knowledge that they have about how men respond to different drugs right. and medicines. And so they say, well, this should work on women because women are just men without a penis. Right. But, That's what they think, but we're not. But you're not. And, <laughs> and your biochemical structures are different. And, and the way that you different. respond to things are different. <laughs> yeah. The way you have heart attacks is different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's all different. And they now are acknowledging that. And mm -hmm. now the research population groups are, are populated with women as well. Mm -hmm. We're getting better, newer data. But the government still runs it. And the and, government is still primarily time. men. Yes. And that is their primary interest, is taking care of men. We still aren't viewed as, as equal. equal or productive people in society, which is hilarious, since we take care of our children and, and we have jobs. <laughs> I mean, we don't, aren't viewed that way, so we aren't top of the list. That's... That's how I feel about everything that comes out of the FDA. They are trying to limit what women get, and they're trying to limit what older people get. So this is my answer. So, so the way I came upon bioidentical hormones is important. Yeah. When I, was, I was started practice in, in 1985, but by 86, I'd seen all these aging people and a huge population from the nursing home. I got a practice from an older doctor who retired. So, so when you were in med school, learning to be a gynecologist, specializing in women and women's issues, mm -hmm. they taught you about fertility mm -hmm. and birth. OB and surgery. But they didn't teach you about aging women. No, they gave us they're, three, they're, three hours, one lecture for three hours on aging women and hormones. One size fits all. But that was a long time ago. But I understand it's no different now. Yeah. But, but now that you are an aging woman... Well, let me, let me go back. In 1986, I wasn't. And I came out of, out of um, my residency, and I had all these older ladies, and I didn't know what to do with them when they came in and they got up in stirrups, and their bottoms looked like they had, they had um, sores. Like, no, like yeah. sores, because they, their skin was so thin from lack of hormones that when they sat down, they got bed sores. Okay. And, it, and it, was, 
it was, for me, it was terrifying. I'd never seen it before. Our clinic had young women in it. So, so we, I tried the usual things that are supposedly, you know, the creams with estrogen and it burned. They couldn't use it. Well, I, well but you're taught in Mexico. If a woman comes in and gets this disturbance and she has these sores, there, here are the five things you can I do. I wasn't taught that in Mexico. You weren't taught that. I had no, I never saw a person like this. I was taught nothing in med school or in residency about that. <laughs> so then you're looking at it going, now what? I was in an African-American clinic. Their skin's different. It's thicker. They don't get this. Okay. These are little white ladies. All right. And frail. And they don't have any hormones. And they're, I mean. And it's painful. And it's painful. And they're, they get infected. And they end up on antibiotics. And they're miserable. Mm-hmm. So, so this was one of the things that I had to learn on my own. Well, I went through all the drugs the FDA approved. There wasn't anything that didn't burn when you put it on their bottom. And they really weren't, at that point, candidates for taking oral estrogen. And they didn't want it because they might bleed you know, have a period or something. Right. So I went to my compounding pharmacy who was in the building and I said, Pete, what, what, what do I do with this? Do you have any idea what I should do with these gals? And he goes, oh yeah. <laughs> like he knew this forever. He I'll said, whip something up. He said, you put testosterone in Vaseline and they put that on their bottoms and their skin thickens up. There's no bleeding. Everything's wonderful. They love it and they get a little bit of testosterone. So they get a little energy not a lot, but some. Yeah. I mean, I that worked. That was compounded testosterone in Vaseline that he made for my patients. It was a miracle drug. So when I then saw PMS, which in 1986 or seven, they of course up until 1999 they said PMS didn't exist. Yeah, That's it's not real. American College of OBGYN said it was like a. We, we were imagining that we had PMS, which is crazy because I've had it. And um, it is, they also said it was not a hormonal issue, which now we know. First, they told us that we were just crazy. I love that. Yeah. They always tell women they're crazy. I mean, medicine tells women we're crazy if we have a symptom they don't understand or they don't get. So then <laughs> they, so I knew it wasn't that we were crazy because we were only crazy half the month. So I, st- I went to Pete again, and I said, so what do I do for this? Yeah. He said, progesterone. That's what's wrong with them. They get to the middle of the cycle. They don't make enough progesterone when they ovulate. And then they feel terrible and have all these different side effects like irritability and, and bloating and gaining weight and craving um, chocolate. So I, he fixed up uh, suppositories to put in the rectum. That's how we did it first. These women were so desperate to be normal that they put them in the rectum and they, they had these suppositories and they worked. Yeah. So then I had a huge group of people coming to me who had PMS. This is before the internet. Yeah. So I, it word was, of mouth. They it all was go, word hey. of mouth. People yeah. desperate for some answer. Yeah. So this continued and I, and I continued to work with Pete and other compounding and, and pharmacies. And the FDA had nothing to offer. They didn't say it existed. If the disease doesn't exist, we don't get a drug for it. Well, that's a reasonable thing. <laughs> I mean... So, so if you if if they deny it, I mean that was American College of OBGYN denied it on my on my test in 1999 to be re, re um, boarded. It says does PMS exist, and the answer was no. The tr- the, the the correct the answer, answer they accepted that they accepted yeah. was no. Yeah. So if you answered yes, you got marked I got incorrectly. That wrong. Yeah. So I went along with it because I had to pass. Right. Right. I knew what they wanted. Yeah. So you give them what they want, and then you go out and practice medicine. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly how you take tests for them, because they're usually 10 years behind at least. Yeah. So you just you answer the questions the way they want you to, and then you practice medicine 10 years more down the road. Well, and a lot of practicing medicine, too, is working with other doctors who teach you what they know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you, I worked with you two older. You have that experience. I worked, I worked with two older doctors who then, well, one wasn't much older, but the, the older doctor who taught me several things about how to take care of patients. Mm-hmm. And, and he used bioidentical hormones for miscarriages. So, uh, you know, people had miscarriages and they didn't know why. So most of the time, it's a, it's a lack of progesterone to hold the baby in. So you, you, you need progesterone. We now know you need progesterone until about 12 weeks. So is that what they call an off-label use? Yeah, this is all off-label. It's all created by a compounding pharmacy. It's all made in a form. The FDA doesn't have the drug or the form or, or the dose. It, it's something I can write just for my patient. So, so like today, the FDA would approve uh, an oral testosterone for a female. Right, but not for males. There's no oral testosterone for males, and you know why? No. 
it causes liver cancer. But it's okay for women yeah. to take it? Mm-hmm. Because they don't get liver cancer or because nobody cares about that? They don't care about it. Okay. So it's not a reason to avoid right. that. Right. They so, so they, men have 16 different kinds or maybe even more of testosterone. We have one, and it's oral, and, it, and it's dangerous, and it causes lots of side effects, too, like anger. The things they say are caused by testosterone so, so it's are not, caused by oral testosterone, it, methyl it's, testosterone. It's not illegal for you to give a woman no. a non-oral type. It's just an off-label use of a medicine that you as a physician are allowed to prescribe. I, t- I took pharmacology. I, I talked to pharmacists. I got my data. I looked up articles. I had yeah. backup. I still, I still keep all that. But I have a reason, a physiologic reason to use what I use. Of course. And it's not rocket science. Right. But, but it's not something the FDA has figured out yet. They, I don't think that's where their interest lies. Well, and that may be the reason I haven't figured it out. But Part of that so, is that these are non-patentable drugs. Uh-huh. Unless you have a delivery system for the drug, like, a, um, like they made pellets for men, only in 75 milligrams, which is crazy because you'd have to get them every other month and... But, but they, they patented not the pellet with the testosterone in it, but they pa- patented this long straw delivery device that you put it in with. Right. So that's how they got the patent. But you can't patent natural hormones or bioidentical hormones. Okay. So they don't, there's no money in so it. So there's no money in the FDA marketplace FDA is really that. run by the pharma- pharmaceutical companies, so. Yeah. And for the benefit of them. Right. Not for the benefit of the, of the taxpayer that's really paying for the FDA, I mean, you may not think that they're government, but they're government. So they're not concerned about the consumer per se. They say they are. Right. They, they, uh, they protest okay. too much. Yeah. But, but the drugs that they pass are extraordinarily expensive, and most patients can't pay for it, and most insurances won't pay so for it. So there are concerns, though. And, and I, These are less expensive. These are not their... Which may be not the explanation a, for why there are concerns. Yes. But over the last two or three years, there have been cycles of... Uh, efforts to shut down co- compounding pharmacies. And they're still doing it. They're still trying to shut them down. Mm-hmm. Which and, it, and they're, it they're, makes they're, me horrified that they would have that much control over our 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 bodies without without a medical degree. They are doctors. They're, the FDA? No, they're not doctors. They're PhDs. They're pharmacists. They're business business people. There are some doctors they hire and they have in there. Uh-huh. They're consultants. They have some. But that's not. But it's more they're not administrative, regulatory. Doctors. They're not doctors who have to find a drug to help a patient solve the problem or deal with an individual person that's mm-hmm. that's having symptoms and is in pain. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about bioidentical hormones and the fact that they are constructed, and at a compounding pharmacy, they can be constructed for the exact amount of whatever that an, a specific individual needs. Right. And compounding pharmacies are licensed and regulated by states and the federal government. Mm-hmm. And they the FDA to, has, has to come in. And, and they have to come in and inspect, and mm-hmm. they have to meet sanitize, mm-hmm. uh, sanitation and consistency mm-hmm. standards. Mm-hmm. So a 100-milligram a, a pill of something has mm-hmm. to have all the ingredients exactly right in it, it has a, for it has every a pill they make. Stricter, the FDA has a stricter rule for the compounding pharmacies than it does for generic drugs. Okay. Generic drugs can be 20% less than it says it is and still be passed by the FDA. But they have a smaller percentage, a much smaller percentage. But as, as a physician, as a you feel like you have a responsibility to check the compounding pharmacies that right. you use to make sure that you can rely on them, to that they're meeting all of these standards. Yeah, I, I have a problem because some people want to go to their compounding pharmacy and they want to do this. And I may not know that compounding pharmacy right. and I'm writing a prescription. I don't know if that's a if that pharmacy is going to give my patient the right dose or, the, or you know, there are little compounding pharmacies. They may be great because that's where I started. That's how I learned. Well, but they, they may be may great on be some great. compounds, but not on others. Right. And so, the, and they may not be great, but I use a big, comp, two big compounding pharmacies in general, uh-huh. which is College and uh, Belmar. And they're both been around for a long time. They both are, reg, are well regulated and I've never had a, a bad medication or a you know a complaint about the drug that they make right and that is amazing compared to how many complaints I get about the generics of the FDA approved drugs yeah. so so bioidentical isn't just about being exactly like what your body makes it's be, about what it's made out of it's about what it is about 
the fact that you can have the dose that you need and not the dose that somebody else needs, like my husband's 6'4 and 250, he needs twice as much as I need. He doesn't need the same dose of an right. antibiotic as me. And they can make it specifically for him and a different one specifically for you. Right. So at the end of the day, the, the message that we want you to hear is that there is confusion in the population in general and among medical professionals about bioidentical hormone and bioidentical hormone replacement therapies. If your doctor is confused, or if you are, then this podcast will hopefully help clarify some of that information. But Dr. Moffin and I have written two books, one, The Secret Female Hormone, and one, Got Testosterone. Both are available on Amazon. Both will give you the explanation in detail of these concepts. Plus, we have 450 plus episodes of this podcast that will help them get the information that they need to satisfy their questions about the use of bioidentical hormones. So hopefully you will be able to use this to help you and your physician make the right decisions for your health. Thank you. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.